Hi, uh, everyone. This is uh, Manuel Serrano from INRIA in Nice, and he's here to speak about the HOP programming language and uh, what he's built using that. Okay, so thanks, Arthur. So do we have to speak close to the microphone? Okay. So my name is Manuel Serrano. As Arthur said, I'm coming from France, southern France in Sofia Antipolis. I work at INRIA, where I'm the leader of uh, a new research team called AND, which uh, is a French acronym for uh, Diffuse and Secure Computing, and we aim at developing theories, uh, languages, and tools for building diffuse application. And this is one of these tools what I'm, that I'm going to demonstrate today. So uh, it is absolutely obvious to say that from the beginning of computer science, computers have been evolving all the time. Obviously, as everybody knows, they are becoming faster and faster, smaller and smaller, and cheaper and cheaper. And the important point for us here is that with each new generation of computers, you can imagine new kind of application. You can envision new application that you want to write. Clearly, with an iPhone, you don't want to write the same kind of application as with a Cray computer. And yet, we are just at the beginning of a new area, a new revolution in computer science. Because up to now, applications were meant to be executed on one computer, which was a dedicated user. And from now on, it's different. In the past, we used to be implementing applications that were just dedicated for a computer, that was running on that computer, and that was sometimes unrelated to any real world. And from now on, things are different. Because as I said previously, computers are now, for instance, mobile phone, as well as MP3 players, which means just objects that you have in the common life. And even more than that, new computers are digital camera. You can talk to your camera with a Wi-Fi connection. Maybe they are also in your TV set, if your TV set is uh, recent enough. Maybe your wristwatch is also provided with a computer, or is by itself a computer. If you have a router at home, it's also a computer. So this means that we are just surrounded with computer. And yet, this is just a, bi a big uh, beginning of something. Already, you can control the light of your apartment with a computer. You can probably control also the oven and the shutter of your windows. Hopefully, one day, you will be maybe you will be able to control your vacuum cleaner with a computer. And this means that actually, the house we live in and the car we drive are just full of computers, and now we are surrounded with computers. And the idea is to write new applications for these environments. We are no longer interested in programming individually each of these devices, but we want to write applications that embrace them all at a time. And so, from a computer scientist's point of view, this raises an interesting question of programming languages, because more or less, application fields demand dedicated, dedicated programming languages. For instance, if you want to write a floating point intensive application, probably you will use a language like Fortran. If you want to implement a GUI for a desktop computer such as this one, and if you are adventurous enough, maybe you will use a language like C++. If you want to control an airplane, most likely you will avoid C++ and probably prefer a language like Esterel. And now the question is, if you want to write a diffuse application for this environment, and one more time, the problem is no longer to address individually each of these devices, but it's to write applications that embrace them all at a time, which language will, will you choose? And so as a small step in this direction of providing new language, we have designed Hub that is exactly meant for programming diffuse applications. So hop in some keywords is just a system that lets you write distributed diffuse applications and run on versatile architecture, loose architecture, poorly specified. This application may be designed for single user or for multi users. It's just up to you. The kind of uh, uh, field we are interested in are mostly multimedia, house automation, and sharing. And and we think actually that this three application field will probably merge because in the future probably there won't be many differences in between a house automation application and the communication and sharing because you want to mix all these together. And so from a technical point of view, what up is nowadays, it's a programming language and an execution platform. So the idea of the implementation of up is if you want to write diffuse and applicatious application, you have to be provided with an infrastructure for that. And exactly for that, we have the web, which is already there and which is also already, which is already sorry, ubiquitous. So the idea of up is clearly to reuse the web. 
not to provide something uh, for the web, but to reuse the web. So if you want something like a metaphor, Hop actually uses the web as a virtual machine, which means that we will compile Hop to the web technologies. So compiling Hop to web technologies means for us that Hop will be 100% compatible with the web. And so instantly we will be able to reuse everything that is designed and developed for the web. So we will be able to take benefit of the entire web. But that's not only it. Hop being a full-fledged programming language, we are also able to implement new protocols, web protocols such as HTTP that come natively with Hop, but also new protocols. For instance, if you want to write a multimedia application, maybe you might be interested in uh, implementing protocol for controlling an IFI system such as MPD. If you want to write a house automation uh, implementation, maybe you want to write extend protocol or thing like that. And since one more time, HOP is a full-fledged programming language, you can implement this protocol in HOP. So since HOP uses the web in a slightly unusual way, I would like to spend a couple of minutes explaining what are the difference between the traditional web and the HOP web. So on that picture, you see the traditional web. You have a, just a bunch of clients, you have a server, and on the back end, you have a, a database. With HOP, we introduce a fourth player, which is a broker, that goes in the middle in between the client and the server. Here, when I say client, actually, I mean a web browser. So now your client no longer address a remote server, but it address a broker that in turn will connect to a server when needed. Clearly, the broker is a good place for implementing mashup because uh, since everybody knows your web browser is not allowed to open new connection to remote server, you have to be provided with someone else that opens a connection for you and the broker could be hit. But it is, although it is possible to write mashup with up and maybe it's convenient to write mashup with up, it is not what up is meant for. Up is meant for controlling your electronic environment. So this means that up is able to communicate with your Hi-Fi system, with your TV set, with your mobile phone, etc., etc. It is able to communicate with these devices either because you are running also another broker on the device and the two brokers are able to communicate, or because, as I've said before, Hop has implemented a protocol that let it talk with one, with individually each of these devices, for instance, MPD for talking with your Hi-Fi system. And when you want to write an application with Hop, maybe you are still interested in fetching data from remote server. For instance, if you want to write a multimedia application, maybe at some point you will be interested in getting the uh, pictures of the, cover, of the cover of the album you are currently listening. So for that, you still need to be able to address remote server. So Hop controls your environment, but still it is able to communicate with remote servers. At the end, since the broker is also a full-fledged web server, it is able to communicate not only with one client, but with a community of clients, which means an intranet. And typically, if you want to write an application, for instance, for controlling the music that you are playing in an apartment, maybe you will want that all the members of uh, the family and the, the, the people that are in the apartment to be able to control the music. So you want actually to design dynamic intranet, and that's the kind of thing Hop can do for you. So before presenting the language, just two applications to illustrate the kind of thing we are interested in. So the first application is about house automation. And since this application requires a lot of uh, devices that I cannot borrow with me, I just show you a small video clip that uh, give you an idea of what this application is. Here, so we have implemented the Xtend protocol in Hub. Xtend is a protocol that uses a power line to address device you have in your apartment, typically the lights, the heating system, the shutters, things like that. Up can be used to control the equipment, but it can also be used to react to events. So we have implemented X10 and, and also, sorry, X10 rely on small devices, such as the one you see here, which are very cheap equipment. Each device in Euro could cost something like 50 euros, more or less, so it's really affordable. It's not extremely reliable, but still you can do interesting things with it. And so we have implemented X10 in Hub, and instantly we are now able to control our electric equipment with web interface. And that's what we are playing here. We are with a web interface switching on and off the lights that is just on the right part of the screen. And we are doing the same thing with our mobile phone. We are just controlling the equipment. 
And you will see, since we are also able to react to event, we are, for instance, able to implement uh, intruder det detection and things like that, only using web technologies and web browser. So that what you see here, the, the movement have been detected and the, the browser uh, react about it. So same thing on the mobile phone. So this is one application, first application, so related to house automation. So I will try to stop it. Okay. So now the second application I would like to illustrate is this time a multimedia application. So the idea is here that in a personal apartment, mine actually, I have somewhere in the apartment a network attached storage, which is thus avail avail available on the network, which contains just my music. And then I can come up and grab any device, any electronic device I have at home and control the music. For instance, I'm able to go to my bedroom, grab my mobile phone and say, please, this album and raise the volume. Then I go to my kitchen, I grab a PDA and I say, no longer play in the bedroom, but now play the music in the kitchen. Then I go in the living room and I say, uh, raise the volume and uh, change the music. And you see on this application, the specificity is that the architecture is really dynamic, that is, you can come up with your device, switch it on, switch it off at any moment, it can appear, disappear, and, and that's it. And the architecture and the, the application work like that. So to give you an intuition of what it looks like to the application, if you are using a device that has a screen large enough, you will be presented with an interface like that, where you can just select the music you want to play. So let's play classical music. Let's select Bach, for instance, and uh, the concerto. So maybe you can hear it. I will just change that. I don't know if you can hear it, but my computer is now playing music. And we can see it over there. Right, I'm just playing music. Nothing very fancy and nothing very uh, uh, unusual about that. Now I will simulate the fact that a new device arrives. and. In that case, a mobile phone. So a mobile phone has a small screen, so it cannot afford a graphical interface with so many details. So maybe my mobile phone will use an interface like that. And now you see the point is that from my mobile phone, I can select a different song, and my interface behind is updated automatically, and I can stop now the music, and once again, my interface behind is automatically updated. So I have a strong synchronization in between all this interface. And so in my application, my multimedia application, everybody sees the same thing. Everybody is aware of the same information at the same time. So how is that implemented? Mainly, all devices that export some musical contents are uh, equipped with a web broker, that is, a hub broker. That is, if you want to provide some musical content, you have to embed a broker on your device. If you want only to control the music, you just need to be provided with, let's say, a web interface. So on this picture here, you see this guy has just, is just used for controlling the music, while this one is providing music. And this means that in these settings, you can come in my apartment with your mobile phone, and if you have some music in your phone, and if you are providing, if you are running a hub broker on your phone, then I will be able to listen to your music on my iFi system. Same thing, I will be able to watch your photographs that are on your mobile phone on my TV set, for instance. That's the kind of thing we're able to do. If you just want to control one more time, you don't need to be provided with a broker, but only a web interface. So that's it for the application. And now some slide about the real thing, which is the programming language behind the scene. So programming with up means mostly programming the relationship in between the client and the broker. So what does it look like, a hub program? First, you have to understand the general idea of the execution of a hub program. Every hub program executes in parallel on at least two different engines. One engine is here for computing, and one engine is here for interfacing, which means that we have really a parallel execution. We have two heap, two stack, but only one shared namespace. So this means also that we have in between the client and the broker, we have your program, and you just 
in your Unix source code, you annotate the parts that are dedicated to the client, and you annotate the parts that are dedicated to the broker. In this picture, the red part are for the client, and the blue part are for the broker. And of course, what up provides is convenient means for the red part to refer to the blue part, and also the other way around. So, because we are able to refer to the other side, we are able to write compact, compact source code, actually. So, now the real thing, uh, since you still know HTML, you already st still know, or you already know HUP, because switching from HTML to HUP is just a matter of syntactic trans translation. At first glance, you go from HTML to HUP by simply inserting an open parenthesis in front of your HTML opening markup, and you get rid of your closing HTML markup, and you replace it with a closing parenthesis, and that's it, you're done, you have your first HUP program. Of course, that's not the entire stuff, and I'm cheating a little bit when I say that, because if you want to do some interface with HTML, you have to implement client-side actions, and these are implemented in JavaScript. So if you are using traditional web technologies, each program consists at least two different languages, HTML and JavaScript. With up, we get rid of that because we have up and hop, up on the both side. The only thing you have to do is before the expressions that are to be executed on the client, you introduce the marker, which is this tilde sign. That means, to the, that means that the following expression will be executed on the client and not on the broker. So here I am. So now what about generating documents? If you want to generate documents with traditional web technologies, you will need to use something different, another language, typically something like PHP. So what you will do is inside your HTML document, you will embed PHP markup that will produce some output, some output that will be string containing HTML, well-formed, hopefully HTML, that will contain well-formed, hopefully, JavaScript expressions. With up, you get rid of that because since up is a full-fledged language, you can just compute on the broker and you can just create your abstract syntax tree which represents the interface you want to build and you will ship that to the client. And now the idea is that you build, you elaborate your interface on the broker, but the variable used on your broker can be used on the client too. And here in this example, for writing the, the two source code are exactly equivalent, that is the dynamically produced table of three elements, of three rows, sorry. For the up version, what we do is we create here a list of three elements, and then we iterate with this iterator map over the element of the list, and so this variable i is successively bound to the value one, two, three. And you see that this i is used here on the broker to construct the interface, that is, it is the content of the table data, which is here. And it is also used on the client to display an alert message when we will click on this table data. So I is used on the broker and on the client. And so you see that the tilde sign delay an expression to the client, and the dollar sign goes the other way around. It lets you refer to broker expression from the client side. So now, once again, since HOP is a full-fledged programming language, you want uh, to use it for realistic program, you need to be able to do some abstractions. So you want maybe to define your own widgets. And so you can define in HOP new widgets and new markup just by defining new function. So you can see here that we define a new markup row, which is just a combination of table data and table row that we use here as any regular markup. So it means that actually HTML is just a preloaded library in HUB and every markup is just a function. So now some um, live, uh, live demonstration to, to give you a stronger intuition of what the language looks like. So I run the demo and I explain the source code afterwards. The first one is, the first demo is really simple, quite stupid actually. It's just open a new window and when the mouse flies over the words, they disappear, except the last, the last one, which is gray. So uh, this is stupid, but this is a live demonstration. And uh, what I can do, for instance, is I can edit the source code of my demonstration. I can replace the word lady by man. I can use this new version. And I can rerun the demo. And now this is a man that disappears. So you see the entire system is dynamic, and everything is evolving uh, dynamically. So R is that implemented. We actually have only 
three words, the lady vanishes that are placed in boxes, and we implement user action, which just makes the two first words disappear, and the last one just to be opaque. And that's it for the first demonstration, quite simple. The second one is slightly more complex. I will run the demo first and explain the source code afterward. So the demo is just a list of three elements, and I click on this button, and I just rotate the element of the list. So this demo is absolutely useless, but you can imagine a, a more realistic one, which is a table with uh, rows that you can sort according to the column. So same demonstration. This one is useful. The last one is useless. So how is that implemented? On the broker side, we create a list of three elements, foobar g, which is bound to a variable el here. This el variable is used, is placed in a, in a box. Then we add a button with the message rotate. And each time we click on the rotate button, we grab this list that we have built on the broker, and we flip the element. So you see on this example that we have a data structure here that is used once on the broker and three times on the client. And that's another specificity of OP to let you reuse the data structure on the both ends. So the previous example was not involving any communication in between the client and the broker once the program has been installed on the client. Of course, for some realistic application, you need to be provided with a mean for communicating with a broker. And for that, we have special functions, special broker function, that we can invoke from the client. So when you define a function with this keyword service, you can invoke it from the client with this keyword, sorry, with this keyword with hub here. And so you invoke a service, and when the service completes, you invoke this callback where V is bound to the result of the service invocation. So how does it work? I run the demo once again. This demonstration is, is just a web interface for scanning my disk. So when I click on this button, it tells me that on my slash TMP, currently I have these files, and their size is as follows. So how is that implemented? We have created one of these services here, which accepts one parameter, dear. So we first, on the GUI side, we create an empty box, a larger one where we put everything. We add a button with a du-sk message. Each time we click on this, message, on this button, sorry, we invoke the service defined here with the value, the actual value slash TMP as parameter for dir. This service actually scans the disk, elaborate a list made of file names here and file size, send it back to the client. The client grabs this list and create a table with table root, table header, and table data. And that's it. So you see, we have exchanged here data structure in, the, in both directions. We have sent slash TMP to the broker, and the broker has sent back a list uh, containing uh, strings and, uh, and integers. And we could have decided to move this table construction into the broker side. And actually, it's up to the programmer to decide where you want to put your program. Do you prefer to put it on the broker side, or do you prefer to put it on the client side? It's just up to you. The only thing that you cannot move from the broker to the client are these two functions here. And the reason, the reason why you can't move them to the client side is because these two functions actually scan the disks. So they, no, they not even exist on the client. So now I would like to explain how we enforce the interface synchronization in the multimedia application. And so for that, I will just use two, three slides. So once again, I run the demo and I extend the source code afterward. This demonstration is absolutely obvious. I create a new window which contains a canvas, and then when I click on the canvas, I draw lines on my interface. Pretty obvious. How is it working? I have a canvas which is just defined here, and then I add an event listener to mouse down event. Each time the mouse is clicked, a line is drawn from the last position of the mouse to the current position. Pretty obvious, pretty regular, nothing very fancy here. Now I will slightly extend this example, and I will add a new listener to my canvas. So I add this new listener, I preserve the previous one, and I add this new one, and what I do here is each time the mouse is clicked, in addition to drawing one line, I call a service function which broadcasts an event 
to all the clients that are interested. And then on below, I create two user interface that will just wait for this draw event here. So I run the demo and I, explic I explain the client code just afterward. So this time my demonstration just spawned three windows. And when I click on this one, all the web interfaces are updated. So you see I have a strong synchronization in between all my web interfaces. So how is it implemented? I close that. So we have one extension to the traditional DOM event model, which is this new kind of event here called server event. In the previous slide, I have used mouse down event, and now I'm using this server event. And so this means that all the clients register to the server event named draw, and when they receive this event, they just draw a line, which is provided, the, the event is provided with a value which describes the mouse position. And so that's it. That's the way I implement synchronization in between all my interfaces. So now some word about uh, the implementation of up. You start with a source code that looks like that. And we have three different execution engines involved for executing this program. First, on the broker side, we use bytecode interpretation for all these blue parts. Then we have a client-side compiler that takes all the client-side expression and that compiles it to JavaScript. And then we have native code compiler that is able to compile your library so all the built-in functions are compiled to native code. So your program, executing your program, involves running these compilers and using all these different execution modes. So what about the bytecode interpreter? Nothing very much to be said here. It is not very fast bytecode interpretation, but uh, that's not a big problem because your bytecode interpreter is fully compatible with native code compilation. So you can call native code from bytecode and vice versa. So if you need to be pretty fast, you can pre-compile your code and that's it. And the, way we, the reason why we use the bytecode interpretation, it's just because of the short development time, the short development cycle. You don't, you don't need to compile anything to run your own program. You just load it on the server, and that's it. You're ready. You can run. So no compilation, easy deployment. That's the reason why we are still using the bytecode interpreter, although it is slow. So for the next version, what we will do is for the architecture that let us embed the compiler, we will on the fly compile the programs the first time you load it. So this way, we will have uh, the native code speed even for, for this part of the uh, broker, broker execution. So now the client-side compiler. Uh, so um, this compiler compiles up to JavaScript, and it's fully compatible with JavaScript, which means that you can call JavaScript from hop, and you can also call hop from JavaScript. We have decent performance for the client-side compilation, which means that more or less you pay no overhead because you are using the hub compiler. That is, the hub compiler delivers source code that has the same performance as unwritten JavaScript code. On some micro benchmark here, you can even see that hub is faster than JavaScript, and this is it for the bag program here. And the reason why hub is that faster than JavaScript, it's simply because BAG is a program written in the HOP style with small function, and it's absolutely mandatory that your compiler is able to inline this small function. And clearly, JavaScript performs no inlining, so it is strongly penalized by the fact of not inlining this small function. But so this benchmark is not is not uh, is uh, uh, how can I say not usual. And in general, the two source code runs at the same speed as you can see for the other programs. So now, native code compilation, more or less it's the same story, is that we are slightly so slower than C when we compile to native code, except for some benchmark, still bag, for the very same reason. There is still this small function that you have to inline, and GCC clearly is not able to inline small C functions, so that's why on, C pr on this program, up is faster. But in general, the performance of up are in between the same performance as C and twice lower as C, more or less. That's the kind of performance we have. Now, some, some word about um, the web server. So here, we try to evaluate the performance of the hub web server. And the first 
test we did was to measure its performance for delivering small static files. And here we are just uh, increasing the numbers of requests we address per second to the hub server, or to all the web servers, sorry, and we measure their throughput. And what you can see here is that for delivering small static files, up is mostly as good as all the major web servers, such as Apache, Lighty, or, or Tomcat. Now for delivering larger static files, up is still pretty decent because it's, uh, as you can see here, faster than Apache and has the same performance as Tomcat. Significantly slower than IT, but still pretty decent. And now the interesting part for us is the dynamic aspect. That is, when you want to deliver dynamic documents. And what we did here, we start to, we wrote, sorry, a small, very simple program in different languages, up, PHP, Perl, and we ran it on several servers, and we just measure the throughput of the server. And as you can see, UP is significantly faster than any server for delivering dynamic content. And the reason why UP is faster is that because you are embedding your generator in the server, you have no barrier to, front, to, to cross when you want to generate a, a dynamic document, sorry. So no performance penalty. And if you compare the two source code here, you will see that more or less, up has the same performance for generating dynamic documents and generating static documents. And this is not the case for the other server. So the problem here with Tomcat, which is pretty slow, is a memory problem. It's just that Tomcat is running out of memory, so it is swapped out of memory, and so it is no longer able to deliver anything. So I think I'm almost done. So in conclusion, Hop is uh, an ongoing project. It is not uh, complete yet. It is not polished uh, enough yet. We have some uh, dark corner and some black sides. But still, we are able to implement a whole bunch of applications. So we are using, uh, on a daily basis, some applications that are implemented in Hub. And uh, I won't demonstrate them. But uh, for instance, one of these applications is Hub Slides, the application that I'm running right now for projecting the slide. So you can see everything that I have been demonstrated from the beginning is just web pages run on my regular Firefox. So you see this is just my slides that I have been presenting to you right now, but with the title of the window presented. So we have a whole bunch of applications. Everything is available on the web. You can just download it. Why one could be interested in programming with UP? Mainly because there are not so many systems that let you write diffuse applications. We have implemented HUB and we have run UP on various devices, such as PC, mobile phone, PDA. So it is quite portable and, um, and still reliable. So you can just download it and try it and try your own application. It is available over there. It is uh, released under the GPL license. So you can grab the source code and do whatever you want to do with it. And that's it. I'm done with this presentation of, of up. Yeah. Excuse me, could you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the question is what about security and uh, what about uh, protecting your private data, right? So uh, right now we are very weak on security and uh, that's a, a true problem. We have the mechanism provided by the web, which means not that much. We have uh, authentication provided by the web. We are able to implement uh, HTTPS or something like that, but uh, that's clearly not enough. And uh, for us, this is just a, a, a very strong and important research uh, topics. And that one of uh, the goal of our research team to study security in languages like Hop. But nowadays, we have nothing. But we, this is something we plan to work on. So uh, you're right. That's an issue.
Okay, so just to repeat the question, the architect, is the architecture of OPS such as no clients can communicate directly, but they need to, to interact with a broker? Yes, that's correct. You, you have to go to a broker, absolutely. But we have something like an architecture which is n not exactly client-server. We are a mix in between client-server and peer-to-peer -peer because it's not that clear who is the server and who is the client. For instance, your mobile phone may be the server, your PDA may be a client, and the other way around, it will depend on your application. Uh, I understand that, but uh, this means that what you will Okay, so first of all, two clients could be connected to the same broker. You don't have to use one broker per client. It's just up to you. But if you happen to have one client per broker, so how does the broker communicate, you mean? Just by using HTTP, for instance, or because you have implemented something based on UPnP, for instance, that lets the two brokers discover each self and they communicate like that, or because you have implemented your own protocol for instance, we have implemented the Jabber protocol, so we are able to communicate using this protocol in between brokers. It's really up to you. But natively, so maybe another way to answer your question, you see this WizApp form that is dedicated to calling a broker. You can use it from a client or from a broker. So as a broker, I can WizApp another broker. How am I dealing with network failure, right? Uh, uh, right now, poorly, which means by hands, with exception and timeout, which is just a pain and which is just unreliable. So I have no good answer for that. And I'm aware also that this is a problem and that we need um, a new construction in the language for dealing with failure. I, I agree with you. And I was just speaking about dark side of the language and places where the language is not polished, in, is not polished enough, and this is one of these sides, of course. So the question is, is there a way to make the broker more declarative than imperative? Um, up, the nature of the language is a functional programming language with uh, object-oriented extensions. So you use it imperatively, or you can build abstraction on top of up. That's just up to you. For instance, we have... Uh, uh, we have students that have been working on uh, reactive extension on top of HOP. So it's not um, a limitation of HOP. HOP is just a language. You use it the way you want to use it. You, you build your own abstractions. I don't know if it is a very good answer to your question. Okay. No more questions? Yeah. Ah. So, uh, have we looked at legacy code and compatibility between HTML, JavaScript, and HOP? That is the other way around. Uh, the first answer is, uh, if you are provided with JavaScript code, don't convert it to HOP, into HOP. Use it as, as it is right now, because it is fully compatible with HOP. So why bothering retranslating it to HOP? Uh, for HTML, uh, well, uh, we have not had the idea yet that it could be useful to translate HTML to HOP. And so we have not looked uh, at, at that in particular. But uh, we have XML parser, we have HTML parser, so we can just uh, pass your old source code and generate HOP from it. I think it won't be too difficult because we have everything in the language for that. So probably we will be even able, e even able to load in the broker HTML source code and convert it on the fly into abstract syntax tree without anything else.
No more questions? Yeah. So, um, uh, clearly there is a huge linguistic disconnect in this region. Um, uh, the magic of language is a distributed language system, right? You've got components going to different machines, but all of the different components are going to the only machine that matters. Uh, in scheme, uh, closure captures a location, not a value. Um, uh, I'm wondering the cost as either variable. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I won't repeat. I won't repeat the question because it is a little bit too long for being repeated. I will just try to grab one example, which was just this one, I guess. Okay. So the question is, what about uh, preserving the semantic of scheme, which is that variables are just uh, locations and uh, lexical scoping? So you're right, HOP is uh, rooted deeply on Scheme, so HOP is an extension to Scheme, and we have a call-by-value by by value semantics uh, when you stay on the broker or the client. But as soon as you cross this boundary, we have a copy semantics. So here we have this data structure, which is built here, and when it is sent to the client, it is copied to the client. So you can have two clients running in parallel, and they won't be synchronized because they use their own copy of the function. And when you call a function from the broker to the client, or the other way around, we use copy. Okay? No more questions? Okay, so, yeah, one last. Yeah, um, yeah, so this language is called links, and it is done by Phil Wadler and, and his student. So um, the idea is not exactly the same, um, because uh, first of all, links is based on, uh, on a mix of XML, of, of uh, ML and XQuery, so it's, uh, it's a mix of two languages. More or less, it's the same kind of ideas, you want to be able to call function from uh, the server and uh, from the client and the other way around. And they use a different approach because, for instance, you are able to use every function on both ends, which means that you can call a function that scans the disk from the client. And automatically, you will execute this code on the broker. So they, they don't have this notion of functions that are tagged to be executed on the broker and functions tagged to be executed on the client. The compiler manages this for you. Um, I, I don't have in mind exactly which protocol they use when they call a function that tra traverses the network boundary, and I don't remember exactly if they implement sharing or if they implement copy. I, I, I should have just uh, uh, reread the paper before coming here, but I don't remember, so I can't answer you. But what I remember is that you don't write your annotation on your program, is the compiler that manages that for you. And uh, so you, you don't have the equivalent of this with up construction. You just call a function, whatever it is, and it's on the declaration of the function that you say it is a function located on the server and the broker. But at the call side, you have no annotation. So it also means that the gran granularity is different because in links, you'd say that this function is a broker, is a broker function, and that's it. Or you say this function is a client function. But we cannot, as we do here, declare just expressions that are belonging to one side. It's, the boundary is just a function declaration, not the expression. And, well, that's the main difference is, as far as I remember.
Okay, so uh, this is something where I have cheated when I said that you can set data structure. That's true, you can set data structure, but you, at this moment you cannot send functions. So there is no way to do that. And I should have mentioned it. So that was a good question. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.